figure it out. Chapter three one through three three. I remember, did we cover those? What was it? It's the fourth lecture. That's all takes a while to try to figure out what class I'm in at the end. Um, so last time we did, what section was this? Anybody remember what section we covered? 3.3, right? We did a little 3.1. So this was 3.3, still part of the review. Uh, so yeah, we're behind here. We're supposed to apparently finish 3.3 before the semester started somehow, right? According to the schedule they gave me. So we kind of need to move on to three four, whether we're ready or not. Three one through three three is review. I know that because of stuff from this lecture we did last time. I just taught that yesterday in my business algebra class. So that's all stuff you've seen before. So let's move on to three four then. We don't fall too far behind. Uh, okay. And you're working on the homework, the My Math Lab homework, and your uh, weekly downloads, uh, weekly uploads, right? All right. So the weekly uploads are due on Sundays. Um, so I think I changed the one that was due last Sunday because it just was way too soon. I changed it to this coming up Sunday. So you might have two of them due this coming Sunday. All right, because we're two weeks in, you get one a week. Okay. I think we shut down with the account weekly upload. So, yeah, three, one, two, three, three. Yeah, we're supposed to cover three, four, 11, one, and 11, two this week. I don't know if we'll get all that done. So, um let me open this up for y'all make unavailable at 30. Oops. this guy hidden or unhide it make unavailable uh, after class today in my office i'll take this three four eleven one eleven two and i'll open it up for y'all so you can download it I won't make this due this Sunday because I don't know if we're going to make it all the way through 11.1 and 11.2, right? So that'll be the following Sunday. So you'll only have the weekly upload for 3.1 through 3.3 due this Sunday. And the next, so we'll be a week behind. That's fine. And um, so where's a book now? Not a book. There's a book. So we're going to go to. Okay, I know there's a scroll bar here. There it is. Three, four. This is more review quadratic functions and applications. That's bigger.
All right, a uh, quadratic function. Y'all know what a quadratic is. It looks like this, ax squared plus bx plus c, right? A quadratic is a polynomial of a second uh, degree, okay? So a quadratic function is where they say, okay, our function looks like that, okay? So here's some examples, right? Just x squared, right? You'd have just x squared. A is one, b is zero, and c is zero, right? So that's a... It's the simplest quadratic you can have, really. It's just x squared. Here's one, three terms. Here, the first uh, term is negative. So remember, all of these, they're all deviations of just x squared. Remember your basic functions? Here's x squared, OK? All of these, you could rewrite this as, uh, you could complete the square and rewrite this guy as something like x minus a number squared plus some other number. I could rewrite that like that. And that, in that form, you could see, oh, it's just like x squared, except it's been shifted to the left a little bit and then shifted up, right? Or you could have a number out here too, where it's like shifted to the left, shifted up, and then this would stretch it vertically, all right? So if you know what x squared looks like, you'll know what these look like, all right? If you rewrite it like that by, by thinking about transformations, or uh, you might recall the vertex formula and stuff like that. Remember when we were graphing uh, quadratics? I remember that stuff you have. Uh, so here, 30 is your B. And uh, what was your vertex? Uh, the vertex formula. Negative B over 2A, right? And that would tell you where the, uh, the isomptote was, the vertical isomptote, so you'd know that. Uh, this thing lied somewhere over here. And then to figure out where this actually is, up or down, you would plug this in to your function. And that would tell you the y value for your vertex. It would tell you it's down here or it's up here, something like that. Your first term, if it's uh, negative, it opens downward. If the first term's positive, it opens upward. All right, so review your uh, how to graph quadratics, okay? Because you want to be able to look at this stuff and quickly think about roughly what it looks like. You know, is this thing increasing? Is this thing decreasing? Where is it? Okay. And this vertex formula, it's easy to remember because it has to do with your uh, quadratic formula, right? Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Remember your quadratic formula? when you solve for this stuff. And what that is, is like, let's say we have something like this, right? There's your vertex formula, the negative B over 2A. Okay, so these are your roots, right? That's whenever you take your AX squared plus BX plus C, set it equal to zero, and you're solving for X. There's your X's, those are your roots. So if this is negative B over 2A, you have plus or minus this. So this link right here is this guy plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And this guy right here is this value and then minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So that's what that is right there. That link between the isomptote and your roots is this part. So, you know, these uh, quadratics, they're parabolas, and parabolas are symmetric. So that's why you get quadratics. Mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Let's go back to this. What do they want us to do? Graph? Okay. They just want us to graph these. So let's do some quick examples then. Let's see. So x squared, again, that one's easy. That's one of your basic functions. It's like this, okay? This is your x squared. 4x squared, it looks just like x squared, but it's been, it's been stretched vertically by a factor of four. 
right? So x squared over here, if I plug in one, one squared is one, right? Uh, if I plugged in two, two squared is four, right? But this guy down here, since it's been stretched vertically, right? If you plug in a one, one squared is one, but then you multiply that by four. So instead of getting one here, you're gonna get four out, right? So when you graph these, they all look a lot alike, right? So you kind of, this is basically the best point to, uh, to label, right? This four tells you that this looks like X squared, but it's been stretched vertically by a factor of four, right? There's certain, I mean, there's an infinite number of points here, right? But some points convey more information than others, right? So there's like convenient points to label that gives you some insight. So that point right there for this particular graph is the one that I would label. It gives you a sense of scale horizontally and a sense of scale vertically, right? And that labeling that one point. So this guy right here, it's x squared, right? So it looks like that. Oh wait, there's a minus sign. So it's flipped upside down, okay? And then this point two, basically what is point two? Uh, one fifth, right? So I could write that as a fraction. So basically we're taking this upside down x squared and then we're compressing it by a factor of five. Okay, so at one, if you plug in one for x, you're going to get back, uh, I know this is ugly, but you're gonna get back negative 0.2 or negative one fifth. All right, so for the ugliest pictures here, what's they gonna look like? Um, and I'm sure they will give us nice pictures of the same thing yeah, here we go so the way they did it is they just plugged in a whole bunch of numbers right how you typically graph if you have no idea all right so early on when you learn graphing they say plug a number in to the function get the y value back plot that point then do it again and do it again and do it again and once you have a whole bunch of points you can just connect the dots and that's a great way to go if you have no idea about anything, right? Other than how to plot the points. But we know about x squared. We know how to use our basic building block functions and and uh, look at manipulations of them, right? So here's your x squared. There's x squared, but again, it's just been stretched vertically by a factor of four. This dude got flipped upside down and see how it's like wider now because uh, Again, it's been compressed by a factor of five or it's shrunk uh, vertically. Okay, that's all review. Here's your basic rules. All right? If A is positive, it opens upward. If A is negative, it opens downward. Uh, yeah. If a is less than one, all right, then uh, it's going to be crushing it, right? Like this example here, the point two, that's less than one. So it basically, point two is the same as one fifth. You're dividing by five. So that makes it wider. Okay, so this is all just about A. Mm. All right, the vertex, we know about vertices. Let's look at this example here. Uh, now. All right, so here's our function. So they wrote this instead of this form. Okay, they wrote it in this other form, the one I mentioned at the beginning. So this is something squared right so you could say well this is the same thing as x squared except it's been shifted to the right by three all right but then it's been stretched vertically by a factor of two. Oh, and then it's been moved up one okay that's what's going on there remember your transformations Right. Any any of these basic uh, things like this, you want to look at that and realize that's just x squared, but it's been manipulated a little bit. There's four buttons, right? You can take a graph, you can move it left and right, you can move it up and down, you can stretch it vertically or stretch it horizontally. 
When I say stretch, I mean it could also be a compression. So there's four things that you can go on here, right? And, uh, and your PlayStation has like 16 buttons, right? So I know that y'all can handle this. There's only four things you need to consider, right? Um, a X minus B, uh, actually in this case three. Uh, oh. Uh, well, in here you got three for these basically because they're always right at like that. All right, other functions. Here's your left and right. Here's your up and down. Here's your vertical stretch. They left out the horizontal stretch. And if you put a number in front of the X there, that would be a, a horizontal compression. Right, there's a part B. Show that the vertex is at this point. Okay. Well, here's our G of X, our vertex. All right, it lies on the line x equals negative b over 2a. Remember the first part of the quadratic formula. So, uh, in order to find out what our b and a are, let me just go ahead and make some more space here. Here's our g of x. So, in this form, it's easy to, to visualize what the graph looks like, right? But if we want the vertex, we kind of need to square this out. Uh, so, let's square this. We would get x squared minus 6x plus 9, and then plus 1. Remember when you square something, right? a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Here it's a minus. That's OK. That just makes this a negative instead of a plus. Right? So we could multiply this out. We have a 2x squared minus 12x plus 18 plus 1 or 2x squared minus 12x plus 19. So all I did was multiply it out so it's in uh, our ax squared plus bx squared. So from here, now it's now we can figure out what our vertex is because we can see our b here is a negative 12. So we have a minus and a minus 12. And then our a is 2. So this is 12 over 4, which is 3, right? So that tells us that our graph, which looks something like that. All right. The vertex lies somewhere on this uh, line x equals three. Where is the where at? Where how far up or down is it? Well, we just plug this into our function. So g of three. All right. If we plug a three in right there, we have three minus three is zero. Two times zero is zero, and then plus one, so we get one. So our vertex is at three, one. Y'all remember this? Hopefully. All right, good. Okay, so there's our graph. Get a snapshot in that. So there's a prettier. So put it on top of my ugly picture, right? Uh, this is pretty, right? So we knew the vertex lied over there at x equals three. We plugged in the three into the function to get the one that tells us how far up or down it is. Okay. So now you, you can graph it either way. You can, if you have it like this, I like it like that because then I can easily just go move it to the right by three, stretch it vertically two, and then move it up one. But if it's in this form, it's like, eh, I need to find the vertex by plugging it in here and then plug that into the function. So I get the Y value. Once I know the vertex, because this is positive, I know it opens upward, right? So depending on how the function is written down, you're gonna take a different approach to trying to graph it. Now let's look at this group. All right, what does this look like? Does it open upward or downward? Well, this is negative, so it's going to open downward, right? So this thing is a square, so roughly and quickly, what does it look like? All right, in my head, I'm like, this is x squared, uh, but no way, this is negative, so it's upside down. Uh, it's been shifted to the right by four. And make it smaller. It's been stretched vertically by a factor of three. 
I'll stretch it vertically, and then it's been moved down seven. Down seven. Looks like that. So I can tell you my vertex is at uh, four, negative seven, right? Uh, or we could uh, we could multiply this thing out, use our vertex formula, right? So you can see how quickly I could see like move to the right by four and down seven. I know exactly where my vertex is, right? But if they gave it to me, let's see if we multiply this guy out. X minus four squared is X squared minus eight X plus 16. So this is negative three X squared plus 24 X. That's 16 times three, 40, 32, 16, 48, is that right? So this would be negative three X squared plus 24 X minus 55, All right? So my vertex, negative B over two A, is negative 24 over two times a negative three. 24 divided by six is uh, four. Yeah, four, boom, four, right? And then if we plug the four into our function F of four, which if we plug it in here, we will see we're gonna end up with a negative seven. I'm just gonna write that down there. So you can see it's nice when it's like this, it's real quick to graph, but they always give it to you like this, right? That's how they like to write it out. And then it's kind of a pain to see what the graph looks like, okay? Now, when it's easy to take this and square it out and get that, right? But if you have this, it's hard to turn it into that. You have to remember how to complete the square, right? I don't know if any of y'all remember how to do that. I know y'all have all seen it, but you probably forgot how to do it, right? So maybe we won't have to do it in here. It's a good thing to know how to do, but you don't need it. You know, if you ever need it, you can look it up and figure it out. I'm sure. Okay. Uh, okay. They they use H and K here. Let's go ahead and throw this in here. So they say, look, you can write it like that. So this problem. They wrote it in that form. They use the letters A, H, and K. So the vertex is at H and K. Okay. Again, whatever you subtract from your X, it's a shift to the right. So y'all remember that subtracting from the X is a shift to the right, right? But adding out here is a shift up. So this is kind of counterintuitive. It's kind of backwards. You'd think that adding to the X is a two to the right, but it's backwards, counterintuitive. Um, yeah, we, we, this a new problem? Yeah, okay, so this one, what does this dude look like? Okay, well, it's x squared, and this is positive, so it opens upwards. Uh, it's shifted to the left by three. Oop. It's shifted up by five. Oh, it up. And then it's stretched vertically by a factor of two. Boom, here's our vertex. That, uh, negative three five. Piece of cake, I can handle this, right? Okay, cool. We want to get into all the cool business stuff, right? Yeah. Really want us to know here. Find the rule of a quadratic function whose graph has this vertex and passes through this point. All right, this is a little different here, right? They're giving us two, they're giving us three pieces of information. They're giving us two points on the parabola, but they're also telling us it's a parabola, right? So we would start off going, okay, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. So that's our vertex. So either this thing opens upward or it opens downward. We don't know, but it tells us it goes to the point 622. Well, where is 622? If that's four, then six is over here, right? And then 22 would have to be way over here. 
Okay, so just going from four to six, somehow we have to go from three to 22. Okay, so what we do is we use the, this form. We know that uh, this guy has to look like A times X minus H squared plus K, right? Just the fact that it's a quadratic function, it has to look like this. They told us this, there's the vertex. Well, that tells us immediately that H and K have to be that, right? Yeah. The X value on the graph. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I did it backwards, didn't I? So, okay, six, and then this would be it. Thank you. Yeah, so if we just go three to the right, somehow we have to go from four all the way up to 22, right? So basically just using the quadratic form, that's what they said. They told us the vertex, that immediately eliminates two out of the three parameters. We just need to figure out what A is. And that's what we're gonna use this last point here for, right? If they give us that, that means that um, F of six should equal 22. But this is f of x, so if we replace x with 6, okay, this should equal 22. And so from there, you can just solve for a, all right? You could square this out. So we have 22 equals, let's see, 6 minus 3 is 3, squared is 9. Uh, subtract 4 from both sides, so 18 is 9a, so a has to equal 2. Right, if I didn't screw up the arithmetic. So you understand the process there, right? So you know the form, you know, we know it has to look like that. That this tells us these two numbers. And then we just need to figure out the last parameter. And we use this point here to do that. Plug plug that X in and that Y. So yeah. Given a function, we want to know the graph. Given some information, we should be able to produce the graph. Uh, let's see. Determine the vertex. Okay, this is just the vertex formula, right? Negative b over 2a, and then you plug that in. We don't need to go over that anymore. We don't know how to do that. Uh, Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. Let's do some word problems. And word problems is where it gets difficult, right? Let's see. Uh, oh, beer. Sweet. Uh, Shanice. Shanice. Oh. Shanice. Shanice owns and operates her own microbrewery. She's hired a consultant to analyze her business operations. The consultant tells her that her daily profits from the sale of X cases of beer are given by this quadratic uh, function. So P is for profit. All right, find the vertex, determine if it's a minimum or a maximum, and write the equation, et cetera, et cetera. All right, well, we, we already know how to graph this, right? Minimums and maximums. If it looks like this, the vertex is the minimum. If it looks like that, the vertex is the maximum, right? So since this thing is negative, this thing goes upside down. So the vertex is gonna be your maximum. So again, what's the vertex? The X value is negative B over 2A. And the Y value is plug that in to your function. In this case, it's called P. And that would give you your Y value. All right. We don't need to go into more detail here. So I'm sorry I'm rushing through 3.4, but we're skipping straight to chapter 11 from here. And I figured we should spend more time on chapter 11 because it's going to be stuff you haven't seen before, you know, rather than basic algebra stuff that you already know. There it is. Upside down, boom, there's your vertex. This guy looks insane. Economics, suppose that the price of and demand for an item are related by this equation. So usually P is, um, P is for price, 
and then Q they like to use for demand. All right, we're going to see these these variables a lot. Instead of just X and Y, we're going to use P and Q because there's a relationship between um, the demand and the price. Right, the higher the demand, the higher the price. So this is expressing the relationship between the two. Okay, so here's our demand function. Uh, and here's our supply function. So these are two different relationships, right? Um, if we took this and rearranged it, let's get, uh, I mean, we could rearrange this and get what Q is, right? But, and we could do that with both of them. So this is a quadratic in Q. This is also a quadratic in Q. They're different. Uh, and we are, with my math lab and stuff, we always have to be very careful. You got to look for that, right? This is in hundreds. So the price here is just in dollars, but Q is items in hundreds. Easy to screw up my math lab for getting this at the last minute, right? And the wording of those problems is complicated. Sometimes there'll be a blank for you to put your answer, and next to it, it says hundreds, right? So you don't have to put it in hundreds. It's already there for you, but sometimes it's not. So if the answer is 10, but the blank says hundreds next to it, and you just put in 10, right? But if that hundreds isn't there next to the block, you have to put in 10 hundred, you know, or, or is it a thousand, right? So be careful with, with your mind map. Um, what do they want us to do here? Find the equilibrium quantity and the equilibrium price. See, this is where it gets challenging for me because I'm not a business major, right? I know the math, right? So I have to like learn the jargon with you, all right? So um, we can graph both of these, the demand and the supply. So let's think about it. What would the equilibrium mean? That would maybe be where the supply equals the demand, right? Because you don't want to make more than you can sell, right? You want to you want to manufacture exactly the number that you're going to sell at top price is what you want to do. So this is important. So we would set these equal to one another, right? And then we would uh, solve for Q, basically. Because if you set these equal, you have two expressions with just Q that becomes a one variable problem, okay? So if we set uh, demand equal to supply, we're gonna get 150 minus Q squared equals 10 Q squared plus two Q. Now they say, find the equilibrium quantity and the equilibrium price. Well, if we set these equal to one another um, and we solve for Q, we're gonna have an equilibrium uh, quantity, I think. Once we know what Q is, you can plug it into either one of these to figure out what the P is, which would be the equilibrium price, okay? So if we set supply equal demand and we solve here, uh, what do we do? We set everything equal to nothing, right? Let's see, so I would have zero. 10 plus six would be 16, right? Uh, then I have plus two Q. If I move that over, I have minus 150. So all I did was move everything to one side. Uh, quadratic formula says the answer is negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four. A, C, all over 2A. So right here we have uh, 2 over 32. Basically, that's negative 1 over 16. That's what that is. Uh, plus or minus the square root of 4 minus minus is plus. And I'll use my calculator. What do we got here? Four times 16 times 150, 9,600. All over 32. Uh, let's just do this as a decimal at this point. We have one divided by 16. This is negative 0 0.0625 plus or minus 9,604. I'm going to think sideways so I get more buttons. Square root, that's a 98, then divide by 32. So 3.0625.
So we do get two answers, but both of these being negative, right? We don't want a negative number. It wouldn't make any sense, right? What is this? The demand to have a negative demand that doesn't make sense, right? So we're going to throw that one out. So we're just going to get rid of that. So if I take that and I subtract 0 0.0625, I get three. All right, so out of the two answers, one of them's not realistic. The realistic one here is three. I might have been able to look at that and factor it, but I did it this way, right? Yes. This guy? It's negative B, right? The two is positive. Negative B plus. I think that's right, isn't it? Our B is two. This is negative B. Is that what you're talking about right there? Uh, here. Uh, I see. I, I'm keeping everything over here, right? So I'm adding the six. That's what gives me the 16. I'm keeping that, and then I'm moving that over here. Thanks for paying attention now, because I will make mistakes like that all the time, and I need y'all to follow and point them out. So I'm not teaching everybody wrong, right? Okay, so we got Q equals three. That's going to be our equilibrium quantity. All right, so what's the equilibrium price? Well, we just set these equal to one another, so it doesn't matter which, which of these you plug the three into for Q. You can plug it into either one, you're gonna get the same P value, All right? So P would be 150 minus six and three squared. You could plug it in there or you could plug it into this one. 10 times three squared plus two times three. Either way, we should get the same answer. Let's see what we get. Uh, what is this? Nine times six is 54. Is that right? 150 minus 54 gives us a 96. We should get the same thing down here. It's a good way to check. So nine times 10 is 90 plus six is 96. Yeah, so that makes me confident that I did my uh, algebra down here correctly. So 96, that's our equilibrium price. Does that make sense? I find the, the business part real confusing. I could do the math, but like sometimes I'm going to need your help to figure out what they're asking for, right? Like, what does this business jargon mean? You know, it gets confusing. I find this class very difficult. Not as hard as the business algebra. That's the hardest one I think I've ever taught. They take like just simple interest, I par T, I equals TRT, right? I par T, the best like, you know, formula in college. And they just run it to the dirt. I've never seen such complicated word examples, you know, with just that formula. All right, let's see. I mean, once I've taught this class like seven years or something, I'll have it all down, but this is, my second semester going there. So I'll be twice as good as last semester. Okay, here's where they graph them, right? They're graphing both of those uh, quadratics. Dang it. So anytime you're doing math, the first thing I do, if I'm working like homework, like anytime I see a function or anything, the first thing I do is pull up my graphing software and graph it. So this is the first thing I do is graph that and be like, huh, this is where they intersect, right? So before I even finish reading the, the word problem, I'm already, I've already graphed the stuff. So I get a good visualization. I recommend y'all do that. Even if you already roughly know what the graph looks like, still graph it on some graphing software, okay? I have this program here called Graph. It's absolutely horrible, but it works. It's like 20 years old. It's really hard to find in Google because if you just type in graph, Pretty generic idea. I'd be like graph program downloadable from Microsoft Web, and then I finally found it to redownload it. Uh, if you have a Mac or Apple computer, you have this program called Grapher. It's already built into your computer, and it's awesome. Right? It's in your Applications Utilities folder. Then, of course, you can download you know multitude of graphing uh, uh, programs. I, I like uh, Wolf Room Alpha. It's a website, it's free. It's, you type in anything you want and it'll do the math for you. 
there's an app you can download. Uh, I think it's three bucks, right? So this is a full blown computer algebra software system. It does everything, right? And it, the other thing that's nice about it is if you pay like 10 bucks a month or something, it'll actually show you step by step, right? Like calculators, you type something in a calculator, it gives you the answer. It's like, great, how did you do that, right? Well, this, if you pay the $10 a month, it'll like, has the option of breaking it down and it'll show you step by step how to do all the math, right? Because you might want that later when we start doing derivatives and integrals and stuff like that, the actual calculus. Luckily, calculus is a lot easier than algebra. There's only like five rules, that's it, it's everything. And the hard part is interpreting it, rates of change, finding minimums and maximums. Uh, algebraic method, that's what we did. Oh, this is their, uh, how they did it. They're like, just graph it and then eyeball it, right? That, that's how people do it in the real world, right? But uh, I guess if you're talking about billions of dollars and stuff, you might want to be more accurate. So you actually do the math here. And they use the quadratic formula here too. So. Yeah, 96 bucks. Or we can do our touchdown dance. We did it right. Example A. Um, we'll work one more example. Next time we're going to go straight to chapter 11. Okay. I'm not going to work every example here, but let's look at some of these. Rental income. The rental manager of a small apartment complex with 16 units has found from experience that each $40 increase in the monthly rent results in an empty apartment. Okay. All 16 apartments will be rented at a monthly rate, excuse me, of $500. How many $40 increases will produce maximum monthly income for the complex? That's a good question, right? Uh, uh, so let's see, I'm gonna have to follow their solution here. My brain is starting to turn to toast. Uh, so let X represent the number of $40 increases. This is the hardest part right here for any word problem is defining your variables, right? They have like this math like math along or something, right? Where they have like simple like questions, but the math is, Simple math, but it's hard. It's really hard. That's why it's like math competition, right? And the hardest part of all any of these problems is the setup, right? Defining your variable. That's a, if you define your variable to be something else, this could be like terrible, horrible math, right? But if you define it just right, it'll make things simple. So that's the hard part right there. So let's look at the question. How many $40 increases? That question right there, the question usually tells you what your variable should be. How many $40 increases? Well, let X represent the number of $40 increases. So they're basically, if you read the question, right? It's like, I looked at it, I was like, eh, I don't know. But if we read the question again, it's like, make the variable the answer to the question, right? So that, that, let that guide you, all right? So if we do that, all right, so the number of apartments rented will be 16 minus X because every time they do an increase, a $40 increase, they lose an apartment. There's a total of 16. So it's gonna be 16 minus the number of $40 increases, okay? Um, the rent is what, $500? That's the base rent. And then we have to do plus 40 bucks times the number of $40 increases, okay? So here is your, uh, what do they use, I for income? Yeah, they use I for income here. I do use P for profit, but we'll use I for income. Uh, so the income here is how much you're making, no wait, that's, yeah, per apartment times the number of apartments, okay? So this might not be obvious. You might not just write that down. We kind of have to go through this mental process, right? How many apartments do we have? How much are you making per apartment, right? Here's how much you're making for each apartment. Here's the number of apartments we have. And we can multiply that out and we get this nice quadratic, right? We can simplify it to this. So there's our income, all right? Um, what do they want to know? They want us to maximize monthly income. Well, this is a quadratic, 
Notice the A is negative. So that means it's gonna be upside down. So all we need to know is what the vertex is. The vertex is gonna be where this is maximized, right? And y'all know how to find the vertex, right? Negative B over two A. So just find the vertex and boom, it'll tell you your X and Y, your negative B over two A. That's how many $40 increases you're gonna to wanna to have, right? And then plug that into your income function and you'll see what that maximum uh, income will be. Does that make sense? This is a good problem here because it's the math is the same as the simple problem, right? So it's a great maximization, minimization problem. So it's almost everything we're going to do this semester is about maximum and minimums, break even points, points of diminishing returns, right? It's all, it's all inter interrelated. All right, so we are out of time. Um, next time we will start uh, 11, chapter 11.